So I was sitting with a gentleman there. Um, he put a lot of gravy on the potato and beef. It tastes really good. I said, it's just like putting the liquid feed on your dry feed and make a difference. The palatability and the intake, because probably many people go back to get the second plate, you know, partially the gravy is really good. <laughs> so we have very exciting trials to share with you. This is a map of Michigan, which is similar to Ontario. We're, we're li really close regarding the weather, you know, um, probably a little warmer this week than here. We did a two trials. Uh, one is a Western Michigan, and another one is a Thumb, Michigan. So I passed, where is the Port Huron? Right here, right? Yeah, right down there. Okay, I drove by um, yesterday. So there are a lot of uh, big dairies in Michigan, and we have quite a few dairies. There are 3,000 cow size. There are many dairies, 1,000 cow size. So the Swiss Lang dairy here has about total 2,000 cows. And this dairy called a Paramount dairy in the thumb has about um, 1,500 cows. So let's talk about the first trial we did. Um, we did this trial in, um, between July and late August, so almost four months. Uh, last year in Michigan is very, very hot, okay? Probably here too. Um, but in Michigan, compared to the year before, we're about 10 Fahrenheit higher on average. And cows has a lot of heat stress. So this farm, they have two settings, have a conventional um, farm and also have a robot farm. We did the trials on both farms. Now, if you look at the robot dairy, uh, we have a tank and pump set up pretty much for the customer here. If you have a robot herd, it's going to be similar um, set up. We have a dairy transition six is the transition cow um, molasses-based liquid feed. The six represent the crude protein is 6%, okay? So depending on the farm, we can custom formulate a different blend. Um, so why there's a two tank here? Um, again, this is a dry feed bin um, providing the pallets for the robot. And the reason we have a two tank is there's a company called a Diamond V, which is an yeast company. So they develop a new yeast product called a Nutritec. It's a, it's a pretty expensive product, but they have shown very good response. So they talk to us, they know um, a lot of times the feed additive like yeast, you put in a big TMR, it's really difficult to mix well. So not every cow be able to get it. So one way is you put in the liquid. So the liquid will mix very well. So when you provide to each cow, they have a better um, even distribution. So the owner want to find out does adding yeast in the liquid feed has additional benefits than feeding the uh, liquid feed itself? Can I interrupt Ty here a second, do you mind? Yes. When we sat down with the owners of this dairy, our initial trial was going to be QLF with Nutritech, all just one product. And uh, he had, one of the owners said, you know, well, how do we know if it's QLF helping us or the Nutritech helping us? So why don't we set two tanks, okay, one with and one without. And that sounded like a you know, great idea, I thought, until I went to set it up. <laughs> Three days later, <laughs> I got all, all of them set up, but, uh, but we did get some great information out of it. So anyway, go ahead. So the feeding rate is four pounds per cow per day, okay? So if the cow milks three times, it's average about 1.38 pounds each milking. Again, it's not going to be that accurate to the decimal point, but you get the idea. So the cow will maximally get four pounds a day. So if you come to milk more, she will not get more than four pounds molasses feed in a day. So cows, again, they have in the one big dry cow barn before calving, so they all received the QOF was a yeast product, Nutritech, for 21 days before calving. Then some cows will go to the conventional milking, and some cows will go to the robot. So this is what happened in the robot. It's a lily system, and they come to eat and milk. So when I dig the feed out, it looks like a molasses it stick the pellets together, okay? They used to have a lot of waste of pellets on the ground. So it seems like 
with a liquid in there, they have less pellet waste. We know the pellets is probably the most expensive feed components in the barn. If you always see a lot of pellets on the ground, if we can help reduce that shrink, that's a big plus as well. That's just the front of the barn. Um, again, Dr. Steve already talked about the diet, so I don't have to spend a lot of time to talk about it. Again, the pre-fresh cow diet, we bring the sugar up to 8.65%. Many people say, oh, that's too high. But again, Dr. Steve talked about, you know, how many sugar in the dry hay or grass? Many dry hay, dry grass has average about 8.5% sugar. So the dairy cows are naturally adapted to those higher sugar ration. Until recently, in the last several decades, we have a lot of grain, a lot of corn, and we try to load them up with a high starch to push them further. But it's probably to some extent really um, against their rumen environment. So the sugar diet is naturally a more healthy diet from the evolutionary standpoint. They have eaten that for thousands of years, or if not millions of years. So again, before we add in QOF to the fresh cow diet, they're running about 5.6% sugar. We bring that up to 7.65% sugar and we reduce the starch from 20, 27, uh, 27.8 to 26. So the benefits of reducing the starch is, is great. I know I talked to some people um, yesterday that the starch here is not as quite high as in the US, but also because the many uh, volume of milk production in US, many herds a little bit higher. So usually they have a little higher starch to, to support that. So if we just look at the fresh cow milk yield in the robot barn for the first 30 days, we saw a big difference here. We saw liquid feed increase the milk by 11.6 pounds and liquid feed was at yeast product here increased furthermore. So about almost 16 pounds. We saw that is really a big difference. So there are several reasons behind it. We believe the fresh cows, many cows may be entering through the energy deficiency status in the first few weeks of calving. If you can provide them with uh, four pounds extra liquid feed with a lot of energy in there, that really helps them to start better. Also, when the liquid feed binds with the pellets, the, the, most likely the cows are, um, they had a more pellet intake, which, you know, provide them an energy to, um, reduce their ketosis and have a better chance to milk more. So one reason why the yeast may have a further improvement, so they did a lot of trials showing a similar response is probably the yeast modulating the rumen function, um, helping the cow uh, have a better immune function. So we know a healthy cows have a better chance to get more milk, especially um, in the fresh period. If we look at the milk fat, they were um, pretty high for the control. On the percentage, they reduced a little bit also for the protein. But if you think about a cow be able to produce over 12 or 15 pounds of milk, there are certainly some dilution effects there. But if we, from um, pure calculation dilution standpoint, their milk fat percent and protein would, would be much lower, okay? so. I mean, they're pretty close. So this indicating those cows actually synthesize and produce more milk fat if we um, on the same volume basis. So if you look at the milk fat yield, still much higher than control. Milk protein yield, also much higher than the control. Now, if we look at the energy corrected milk, accounting both milk fat and protein, this is the what you're going to get paid at the end of the day. Okay, is energy corrected milk. We still saw a, over eight pounds difference for the liquid and 12 pounds difference um, for the um, Nutritech with the liquid, okay? Again, there's about 30 cows. Each group finished the study in the first 40 days, maybe not a huge number. And especially for the fresh cow, they have a big variation in the milk yield. Some cows doing really well, some cows may not doing really well. So there's a big variation there. So if you look at the milking frequency, 
on the robot, okay? And the control, they're about 2.85 times per day, and with the QOF is about uh, 3.1, and with the Nutritech seems to be a little higher, uh, not a whole lot. Um, what you can see, it may not be a huge difference, but consider 100 cows, okay? If you compare 2.85 to 31 times 100, that's over 20, 30 times more milking. So it's likely the combination of higher milk output and also the uh, palatability of the liquid feed entice the cows to come to milk a little more. You know, combination produce more milk. But also, this barn is about, about 65 cows per robot, so they're pretty full. So they're not much wind of time allowed cows to come to milk more. Even the cows had the motivation to come to milk more, but because the management factor, you know, all the barn space probably limited some, you know, further increase of that. Just a comment. Okay. Uh, those of you that have Laley robots, the milk access screen was set to maximum five milkings per day. For the fresh cow. For the fresh cows in this, in, with this data right here. So basically what that's saying is that when the cows were on the QLF, more cows got milked 4X than in the control cows. Correct, yeah, you can set up that. For lay cows, most people probably set up only three or four times because they don't want some cows to come to milk more to take other cows' time. So it's a, it's a combination of nutrition and management. Okay, now we also, they have a rumination color there in, on each cow, so we'd be able to collect the rumination data. And I will talk more in the next presentation, but this is what happened. On um, three groups, they find about 25 minutes higher uh, with QOF and 33 minutes higher uh, with Nutritech, okay? So we think about half an hour increase is, is a pretty big increase in the rumination time per day. So rumination has been used more and more on the farm to monitor the cow health and performance. Usually the cows have a good jaw matter intake, good health, um, comfortable cows, they have higher rumination. Now, and we present it to the owner, so they're very excited. They say, okay, let's continue feed the stuff. This time we, we're giving to all the cows, all the heifers, we're feeding to um, 100 to 200 days, okay, not only the fresh period. So what you see here, um, from day zero to 200 days, there are about 100, over 100 cows per group, so this time we got more cows in there. Compared to the control, um, the liquid feed had almost uh, over eight pounds increase um, in the volume. Um, we saw a higher milk fat percentage, similar percent of milk protein, so milk fat yield and milk protein yield um, was much higher. If we look at energy corrected milk, it's about nine pounds higher energy corrected milk, okay? Now, you may ask, what if you break down the lactation stages we want to look at? Is early lactation or mid-lactation, uh, which one has the biggest response? So, if I break, break down that data from day zero to day 60, if you look at the milk yield, it's almost, uh, 16 pounds higher milk yield in the first um, fresh period, okay? Also higher milk fat, similar protein, much higher milk fat and protein yield, and the energy corrected milk is almost uh, 19 pounds higher, okay? And those cows didn't lose more body weight, so they actually have a little bit higher body weight. They probably eat more and have a better energy um, balance. If we, if we look at between day 60 and 120, the difference getting smaller, there's only three pounds there, and the energy corrected milk is about uh, four pounds, uh, uh, 3.5 there. Um, if we look at 120 to 200 days, there are six pounds difference there. Um, for energy corrected milk is about uh, seven pounds there. So still big response here, but mostly you will see a biggest response in the early lactation, where cows are energy deficient and you'll be able to get them to eat more. 
So if we look at the conventional side, conventional herd side of the same dairy farm, again, they have 1,500 cows, and they feed KOF with the yeast uh, right here. So we, we, we started in July 6, which is uh, uh, cows had a lot of heat stress. We used the three months from March to July as a, as a baseline data. This is the point where we started the liquid feed. As you can see, the dry matter intake was much higher. They had some mycotoxin issues towards the end of the trial, so you see a big variation in the dry matter intake. One thing is um, the, the, the feeding management may be not be perfect on this farm because you see a big variation in the dry matter intake because sometimes, depending on the feeder, they do not necessarily feed the cows exactly the same time, same day. So sometimes you go early, you have higher refusal. Sometimes you go there late, the cows will eat everything. So depending on the day, he may drop more feed or less feed, depending on the previous day's intake. But the big picture, if we put in a graph like this, is compared to the pre-trial, we had a seven, two points pounds higher jaw matter intake. We bring um, the cow's intake from 28 pounds to over 35 pounds, okay? If your pre-fresh cow be able to eat that, we know a lot of research show cows eat more before calving, they will eat more after calving, and they will have a smooth transition, okay, compared to those cows had less feed intake. If we look at the uh, milk yield for the conventional barn, again, this is the start of the trial. Uh, compared to the baseline, even in the hot summer, they still see a, a quite a fast increase of milk yield, okay? Um, compared to before, again, we had a 15.6 pounds of increase on the conventional cows. So the second farm is in the farm here, uh, Michigan. This is a farm facility, and there's two gentlemen there sitting here. <laughs> they're, they're not sleeping Look, yet. One of them's working and one's playing on his phone. <laughs> I can tell you exactly the story. This guy right here, on that day, he was very excited. He said, whoa, this is a good diet. I'm going to take a picture. <laughs> For real. And Joe is picking up the ration. I can tell you this ration, um, the owner actually is a dairy nutritionist. He's very influential dairy nutritionist. So he likes the liquid feed. The, in the first meeting we met, he wants to feed, what, 10 pounds? Mm -hmm. We said, oh, that's a little too high. He said, I really want something to help stick my forages, straw, everything together for my dry cow. We said, that's a great, but even we show a great response, we're never going to sell it because nobody's going to pay for 10 pounds, right? <laughs> so we kind of mid in the middle, we dropped that to 5 pounds, and they are feeding almost 10 pounds of straw, dry matter basis. And everything was chopped very fine. He also adds a lot of water there. So the dry matter percent of that diet is 35%. It's really wet. So if you look at the ration, dry cow and pre-fresh cow, uh, they were feeding nine pounds straw before. But since they added the, the QOF with Nutritech in there, five pounds as fat rate, uh, feeding rate, their dry matter intake went even higher. But because this farm, their dry matter intake was already 35 before. So it went further higher. He said, I don't want, I don't want them even higher. I think 35 is plenty. Their rumen is big and you know, cows looks good. So what he did is to add a two more pounds of straw there to kind of slow down and maybe try to reduce the cost a little bit. So the cows end up eating 11 pounds straw on a dry matter basis. So the total dry matter intake was formulated for 33 pounds. Um, again, for the fresh cow period, he also fed a five pounds in there. Um, this, the trial was started in May. So on this farm, they don't have a, um, they don't, they don't have a lot of uh, accurate milking uh, tracking system. So the milk yield is not as um, easily to track compared to another farm. So we're just going to show you the fresh cow diseases here. If you look at the total rate disease of the fresh cow, the red bar here is 2015, okay? The blue bar here is 2016, where the trials are conducted. So because 
June, July, August are the summer months. So we compare 16 to the previous year, same months, same, almost same weather. And the only difference were much hotter. So cows has a more difficult situation when we run the child compared to the year before. I don't, I don't think you mentioned this, but the average temperature was about 10 degrees hotter in 2016 than it was in 2015. And we had, I think we had 23 days over 90 degrees in July and August versus two days in 2015. So that makes this even more impressive just because we know we had a lot more heat stress in 2016 than we did. So we saw a big reduction in the total diseases, uh, which I will show you what they are. They were running about 24% the year before, dropped to 10% in the summer when we feeding the liquid. And the death rate, I um, mean, June, he doesn't have any fresh cow die. We know this farm has 1,500 cows, if 10% cows in the transition cow, you know, if you don't have any cow die in the first 40 days, that's a pretty good. Um, August, he probably had more cow die uh, because the weather was very brutal or different situation there. But the death rate probably um, ov overall average dropped from 2.6% to 2.3%. Uh, if we look at the Mechitis, there's a big reduction in there. Okay, They always struggling with the Mechitis problem every summer until this year. Um, we reduced from 8.7% to 1.3%. Um, so mechitis, a lot of people had research. What's the most important uh, indicator of mechitis before calving? One important thing is dry matter intake. If the cows can eat more, get more energy in there, has better immune function, so it have a easier calving, you know, less likely to have infection in the reproductive organ um, and have the uh, retain a placenta or mitritis. So that's simply an uh, indication of a better transition cow program. So similarly, if you look at the DEA, uh, displayed abomasum, they were 3.6% uh, the year before and dropped to 2% this year. So for every 1,000 cow, that's 15 fewer DEA. Um, if we uh, 15 less DA usually is about a saving of $5,000. Um, again, this is, we know all the metabolic diseases are linked together, okay? So if you have one reduction of one, usually you see a reduction of other. You got a question? In the dry cow diet, it's pretty fresh. Yeah. Um, did you make, was there any adjustment made to the vitamin and minerals after the intake increase? So that they, they uh, or did, they just let intake and the animals consume. The, the mineral mix was not changed. If they eat more, they eat more minerals and more vitamins. Right. If they eat more intake, they can eat more. Well, on this farm, if you remember right, they did bump up the intake, but then he added straw to bring it back. So the intake actually on this farm really didn't change that much pre liquid versus post liquid. Because he was holding it at 35 pounds, right. he added more straw to hold it at 35 pounds pre-fresh. Yeah. So when he balanced, he balanced originally for 35 pounds intake on his mineral content? 33. 33. 33. So if you add a two pounds of straw, that, that mineral probably didn't change much, but the proportion of that mineral may be reduced. But you know where I'm getting at, is yeah. that, that you could be in excess if, if you are right. careful. Correct. You can see that then. Usually the dry cow, I think people try to feed a little more, some, some of the uh, mineral vitamins just for the immune function or, you know, they're not, usually not at 100% requirement, at least 150 or 200%, right? So very interestingly, we, we had a rumination coder on this farm as well. So similarly, we find um, this is compared to before this is during the trial, even in the hot summer, we still see a 20 minutes higher rumination in those cows. Okay, why is that important? I will talk about it just a little bit. So on this farm, just to look at the economics, um, the Nutritech is pretty expensive. So it costs about 15 cents per cow per day. Uh, this, this costs including the liquid and Nutritech. 
Um, we increase the feed cost 22 cents per cow per day for 21 days before calving. That's 4.6 bucks. We increase 15 cents per cow per day after calving for 30 days. That's 4.5 dollars. Um, you spend $9,000 for a thousand transition cow, but just based on the reduction of metritis, DEA, and death loss, you have a much bigger return. Okay, so on this farm, we have almost four to one return. Just look at the transition cow health, and we know the healthy cows will produce more milk during the lactation, right? So there's additional benefits to that. So that finished my first presentation, and I will talk about rumination and rumen pH. Any questions at this point? So the, the robot. That you, the, the liquid feed through that robot. Yes. That group of cows, where they had fed any of the liquid in the bunk too or not? Was it just the robot? In the, in the robot, is everything go to the robot? Yeah. Now, at the, uh, all the cows, though, would have got QLF through the TMR prefresh? The dry milk. cows. Correct. Yes. Yeah. All of them, the control group and every, everybody. Right. Yeah. So that means the robot trial, it, like control group got the, the dry cow stuff too, like when they were dry, but everything else, it's so there was still that big difference. Correct. Right. Yeah. It must be something related to intake and all that. But you want to know my opinion, which doesn't mean anything, just me, but my opinion is by getting that extra sugar in that diet, we change that rumen environment in those cows, and we not only got the energy from the QLF on top of that diet, right? I think we also stimulated better NDF digestibility, and to get that kind of milk response, they had to eat more out of the bunk too, and we probably pulled more energy out of the bunk and the corn silage and everything else in there by stimulating different rumen bacteria, which sugars do, and we, Stephen, I think, has shown that, that we will help drive NEF digestibility. So we probably, we did a number of things. We added palatability, we got them to come in and milk a little bit more. We probably had less pellet waste because we stuck that pellet together, so every time they pick their head up, they're not dropping pellets on the floor. I think we stimulated uh, better appetites and they, they, they probably ate more, but we can't track that in a robot farm because you got all the cows together. You got the control animals and the QLF cows all coming together, but my, my personal opinion is to get that kind of response, I think we changed the rumen and they ate more out of the TMR as well. So. Which is, uh, you know, the rumination time is also a partial uh, indication yeah. of that. So. And were you feeding to production, or were you just, or stage of lactation, or were you just giving everything, all those cows, four pounds of, of liquid feed? The way the robot? trial was set up, it was four pounds to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And no the trouble with really lactation like, cows, right? Like well, no, they were going out to 200 days now. Because the first trial, the first trial, the first portion is a more fresh cows. Then after they saw a good response, they decided to extend that longer to see if further, you know. And no trouble with soup in the bowl with that volume? The, the, the only time we had trouble is the robot screwed up a few times, a couple times in the trial. And there was a computer glitch where it dropped 10 times what it was supposed to. We got into <laughs> bowls and we were on that day. Um, and then where the, a lot, all the fresh cows go to one, or two robots actually, but they go to, actually go to one robot. When yeah, first Friday. Seven. And that robot, because uh, you got cows coming in, some of them get milk for the first time, they would get build up in that one robot a lot of time. And it wasn't just a liquid though, it was pellets too. Because some cows won't eat anything. They, they just, just take a one get, cow not eating anything that's starting to build up. Build up. But after that, that, that's the only robot may have a problem because they only put a two, three days, you know, first three days cows in there, especially like a heifer. they would never be milked. You still got to train the cow or fetch the cow and might be a little timid in there, not comfortable eating. So, so then we kind of 
right now we kind of dropped that feeding rate. Yeah, we've, we've cut back both the pellets and the liquid in that one, you know, to compensate for those. But after that first two, three days, there's no problem on, on the robot. To answer your question, yeah, periodically they would clean out the pans because, you know, if you get a cow that for whatever reason didn't eat very well, you know, all her, all her liquid and pellets are there, and it's not just the liquid, it's the pellets too. Normally, the next cow in comes and cleans it up, though, you know. From time to time, they would have to clean some pans up. No problems in the winter time? No. With the liquid? I don't know, we didn't show the slide, but we did, we did insulate the lines in the pump and heat taped it. So we had heat tape on all the lines in the pump. We didn't have, we didn't have the storage tank insulated, uh, but we had the lines in the pump insulated and never had any issues. But when does it freeze, this stuff? No. It doesn't freeze at all? It won't freeze, it just gets thicker. <laughs> I don't know if they have this saying here, but my parents always used to say I move slower than molasses in January sometimes. And that's that's where that comes from. Molasses gets thicker. So I'm gonna start the next part. It's talking about we saw some big increase in the rumination time there. So I dig a little bit deeper on what research we have regarding rumination and rumen pH. I think they're very important. We, we in, you know, we'd always talk about the rumen pH, what a healthy diet, and the cows less sorting, they have a higher rumen pH. We think about a cow as a fermenter. Basically, she is a machine, right? Every day you want to deliver the feed almost at the same time and never let the cow run out of the fuel so she will have a more consistent fermentation, okay? What happened? If you let the cow run out of feed, is next day you deliver the feed, the cow charges the bunk, they're gonna eat a big meal, then their rumen pH drop. If their rumen pH dropped, that slows everything down because the bacteria digesting the fiber, they want a higher rumen pH. So if the cow, you put the cow into subclinical acidosis, the rumen is not gonna function well and you're gonna see a lot of problems, okay? So first we're gonna talk, talk about rumination. So rumination, the cow spend a one third of the day ruminating. So that's very important. I spend a one third of the day sleeping. So uh, most people will, probably a little less, but just tells you it's very important. Um, they are influenced by diet, health, environment. So on the big dairies, like thousand, thousand cow dairies, now they pretty much all have the rumination color. They not only be able to catch the uh, heat or estrus cycle of the cow, uh, when to breed them, but also the rumination um, fluctuates. So if the cow had a drop in rumination, even, sh even if she doesn't show any clinical sign of diseases, you'll be able to pick, at that, pick up that cow a few days before the cow had a problem, okay? So we're gonna use that rumination data, be able to manage the herds better and catch problem earlier. So traditionally, we thought, okay, rumination, if the cow eat more, eat more fiber, it's gonna more chewing gut more, okay? Now we find out the cows and nutrition factors, such as jaw matter intake, fiber content, particle size, digestibility, they all have big influence, and they set the normal maximum time on rumination. But again, non-ideal management will reduce the rumination. For example, heat stress, overstocking, not enough bunk space, not enough laying time. All those will reduce rumination. So why rumination is important? Because every time the cow ruminate, it produces saliva. The saliva is a buffer, is an alkaline buffer that go to the rumen, help you increase the rumen pH up. But a lot of feed, when you ferment in the rumen, that produce a lot of acid. If you don't have that buffer, the rumen pH will drop. But if the cows be able to ruminate more, more saliva coming, more sodium bicarbonate produced, it maintain a rumen health and cow comfort. So if we look at the average rumination, 450 to 550 minutes per day. So your goal of managing the farm is to have less than 30 to 50 variation on a pan basis. So I went to many big farms, they have a big swing on their computer. You can see the variation to the baseline. 
um, a good managed herd, they have less variation. If you have more variation, it indicating the diet you, you, produce, uh, you provide it to the cow every day, maybe not consistent, or the cow environment or stocking density, all those changes, okay? So research shows some common activities will have a big impact on the rumination. Heat stress reduced 30 to 80 minutes, overcrowding reduced 50 to 100 minutes. Mixed parity pens means you put a heifer and cows together, especially on big farms. Okay, that will reduce 75 minutes. Why is that? Because the heifers, the cows are more aggressive, they're bigger size, and the heifer may have more difficult time have access to the bunk, if especially um, you're overcrowded. And also, uh, the cows are a social animal, so they interact with each other all the time. You know, they have a ranking in the herd. All that activity will drop their um, rumination. And calving, um, almost a 200, uh, 170 to 250 minutes job. So estrus, um, uh, 75 minutes job. Mastitis, 40 to 100 minutes job. So all the events, you're gonna see a drop in the rumination. So this is a graph telling you the point here, zero point here is a day of calving. What you can see here, uh, this is the rumination time. The, the line on the top is a healthy cows, and the line in the bottom is the cows not, not healthy, has metabolic diseases. So what happened is, all the cows had a job in the rumination at calving, okay? Um, either because they're not comfortable, they're not eating much, and they should have picked up quickly after calving. What you can see is for the first seven days, healthy cows increase 70 minutes per day, unhealthy cows increase only 50 minutes a day. So if you look at the first two weeks, there's a big difference in, in rumination here, okay? Many trials has confirmed that. So using, so any strategies can help your cows increase rumination. It should help increase your health as well. This graph shows you rumination decreases several days before a DA is diagnosed. The day zero here is a DA show clinical sign and you'll be able to call Amanda for service. But I'm not putting Amanda out of job. Before you're calling Amanda, if you have the, the tracking system, you'll be able to see uh, the rumination started to drop a few days before that. And it will give you alarm what happened. The cow not comfortable, you know, uh, maybe to separate her, provide um, better environment for her to eat, and you may be able to prevent the DA, right? So I talked to Amanda in the lunch, she said the rumination is big, is very important on the cow management and health. So this is the grouping strategy I talked about. What happened, the blue bar here, it just look at the blue bar, not the red bar. That's the distribution of uh, first lactating heifer when they were mixed with the cows, okay? This is about average here. Most cows are right here, so the average number of the rumination when they're mixed with cows, they're 363 minutes. Then the red bar is when you separate the heifer out to another pen where they have their own space, their own feed bunk. See that red bar here, the rumination really increased to 428 minutes. So that just tells you without changing anything, the grouping strategy, the stocking density is very important to optimize the rumination uh, and cow health. So next we're gonna talk about rumen pH. So think about the cow is a big machine that can produce a beer. You put all the stuff in there, let it ferment, okay? This is a Cornell University study showing the rumen pH and time below pH 5.8 for cows fed a high and low starch diet during the fresh period. So why do we care about the pH 5.8? Because we know if your cows had a three hours per day rumen pH below 5.8, the cows are at risk for rumen acidosis. If your cows had a five hours before rumen pH below 5.8, that's a very high risk of acidosis. So when they call this high and low starch diet, I look at it, their high starch diet in this study is about 26%, and their low starch diet is about 21.5%. Okay, there's a big difference here. What you see, 
The bar on the top is the cows fed a low starch diet. Again, as you would expect, they have higher rumen pH, and they had less time, okay, below 5.8. So the red bar is the cows feeding a high starch diet. They really had more time per day, had a pH below 5.8. So we, again, it's a dilemma there. We want the fresh cow to have more energy, but we really be careful. We don't want to feed them too much starch that will depress uh, the rumen pH. Then the, if their rumen is not functioning well, they're gonna further job intake and they had a problem in their diseases. So well, one thing we can do is to feeding a higher sugar and reduce the starch diet, which I will have a slide to show you. So in addition to that, we know compared to the high moisture corn versus the dry corn, because the fermentability is different, okay? Although they are the corn, um, the, if when you feed a dry corn, the line on the top, their rumen pH maintained much higher than the cow feed a high moisture corn, okay? This is just tells you they're same starch, but due to the different processing, different moisture, uh, different fermentability in the rumen will have a big impact. So if we look at, this is very interesting. Every dot on the top is a single meal. So not only you say, oh, my, cow, my cows eat all the feed in the bunk, but more important than that is how many meals a cow consume, okay? Is she consume a big meal or several small meals throughout the day? That's why the pushing up feed is very important because if you can get the cows to eat the feed more consistently, the rumen pH will maintain high. If the cows, if, the, if you don't push up feed for a few hours and you suddenly push up the feed, the cows eat a lot of feed, their rumen pH will drop. So every dot here is a meal intake. What you can see here, when the dots are very close, it means the meal frequency are very high, the rumen pH stay above six, pretty good. Every time you have a big gap here, it means cows hasn't been eat for a few hours and they suddenly eat a big meal. What do you happen here? What eat a big meal with a gap here, the rumen pH dropped. So it's important is how much feed a cow eat a day, but it's also important how did the cow eat it? Are you creating the right dining experience for the cow to eat you know, every two hours, every three hours, instead of a big bite and then not eating later? So this study shows you, uh, they feed a 16 cows exactly the same diet, okay? Um, this is the time of eating. This is the rumen pH. What you can see here, even the 16 cows eat the same diet. They have a huge variation in the rumen pH there. Why? The first, every cow is different. Some cows eating the same diet, they're okay. Some cows are more susceptible but also indicating probably the cows have a sorting going on there. Even they eat the, provide the same diet, they're not end up eating the same amount of fiber or same amount of starch, okay? So managing a pan versus managing an individual cow has a big difference there as well. So this is a study in Canada. Um, actually, they're a professor at University of Alberta. They did a study replacing uh, starch with sugar. So compared to, it was control and 5% sucrose um, in the first 28 days in milk, basically the fresh cow, they saw an increase in dry matter intake, then they able to increase the rumen pH from 6.06 to 6.21, um, okay? They also increase the total tract organic matter digestibility. Basically, uh, why is that? Because the rumen box digests the sugar is different from the rumen box digests the starch, okay? So once you, the rumen box digests the starch will drop the rumen pH, and once the rumen pH drop, the fiber digestion slow down. And the rumen box digests sugar, convert the sugar to a different type of fatty acids compared to um, starch. So it doesn't really drop rumen pH. Now many research actually have shown a higher rumen pH. So feeding a sugar is a more healthy diet to maintain a better rumen pH. The last part, so here is a quiz. What is the relationship between rumination and rumen pH? So I guess most of you are gonna say higher rumination, 
will have higher rumen pH, right? I think in many, in many cases that's probably true, and I'm gonna show you a study uh, that's by Minor Institute, which is close to Canada, at Shazy, New York, uh, which is by one hour from Montreal, uh, the, in collaboration with Cornell University. This tells you, uh, they look at, it's pretty complicated, okay? Amanda talked about the stocking rate of the, of the barn. So the 100% is the stocking rate of barn, 100%, perfect, not overstocking. 142% is your overstocking, 42% of cows in there. Um, the idea is when you overstock the cow, well, I tell you, in many farms in the U.S., it's very common. You know, I have never been to a farm less than 120% stocking rate. They mostly 130 or 140. So that's a very common thing in U.S. because the bank who lend the money to the producer, they want you to put more cow. Okay? They are now looking at the milk production per cow. They're looking at milk production per square foot of your barn. So the different indication of your production. Um, if, so NS and S, NS means no straw, S means with straw. Their idea is we're adding a little bit straw, providing a little bit more additional fiber to see how does that affect the rumen health and intake. So their, their hypothesis is if the cows are overstocking, they're not gonna have the opportunity to go eat the feed at the same time. So they're gonna have more variation in the intake uh, more problems with the rumen pH. If I add a little straw in there, I kind of uh, help the rumen health a little better, right? So if you look at the intake, kilograms per cow per day, they're almost the same. And NDF, again, is a, a fiber intake, uh, a little bit higher for straw versus no straw. Also here, straw versus no straw. And the physically effective fiber uh, NDF intake also a little bit higher, as you expected, because you added some straw in there. But what do you look at the rumination time, okay? The mean rumination may not be huge different, but the rumination, uh, the rumin ruminal pH uh, below 5.8 is a huge difference. You think about um, at, a, at 100 density, without straw is 2.3 hours under under 5.8, um, pH 5.8, then about 1.9 hours for adding straw. Then on the overstocking cows, they had over four hours that really has a low rumen pH. And adding the straw be able to help a little bit. It's still not as great as at a 100% stocking rate, but they did drop from four hour to 2.7 hour, right? So again, three to five hours have a risk for subclinical um, ruminal acidosis and five hour you have a high risk. So if we put it this way, what's the difference? Stocking at 142% versus 100%, there's 1.4 hour difference. Straw versus no straw, they're almost one hour difference in the time that rumen pH has a big problem, okay? Now, what you guess on the rumination time? Okay, you would think the cows had a high straw or a hundred, have a higher rumination time. But surprisingly, they find the rumination time is very similar across the four um, studies, okay? Um, but one thing they found a very different, they call it eating latency for the fresh feed. Basically means how, many, it, how long it takes the cows to eat the fresh feed. So it takes about 20 to 28 minutes for at 100% stocking density and takes 40 minutes to the cow to finish the fresh feed. Be why? Because many cows don't have access to the feed barn. They have to wait. So that really put cows, um, if the, the first cows be able to eat and they start to sort and the, the, the second group of cows start to eat because they're hungry and they're waiting, they want to eat more and they sort, they eating, they have, a, they just eat a different feed and they try to eat more to catch up. There's the space, okay? So if the eating and rumination time have not changed, why is the rumen pH different? Because the rumination provide buffer. Okay, if they're ruminating at the same time, do they, they, they're supposed to provide the same amount of buffer. So where is the buffering potential coming from? So very interesting, if you look at the laying time, Okay, they have almost 14 hour laying time for the 100% stocking density 
and they dropped about an hour or so when you add 142 percent stocking density. And those cows spend more time in the alley than in the bunk, uh, than in the uh, laying the bed because they don't have bed. You know, they, they have more cows in there than a stall. So, and they talk about some other studies showed when the cows laying down there and ruminating, the quality of buffer production is higher when the cows are laying there compared to standing in the alley. So the rumination time is important, but where are the cows ruminating is also important because they produce a different amount of saliva, maybe have a different chemis, uh, chemical um, compound in there too. So they look at the rumination within the stall, they're 86 minutes, 80% uh, of um, total rumination is ruminating with stall when your stocking density is low but you drop that 80% when the stocking density is high, okay? So basically tells you if the cows laying down comfortably ruminating, they have a better buffer capacity produced than cows standing there. So that tells you, I think the data is very um, intriguing. So again, you have to have three things. If you do the three things right, your cows will make money for you. First they be able to stand to eat and drink. Second, they be able to stand to milk. Third, they be able to lay down. If you can do the three things right, they will make money for you. So the implication of this part, rumination is highly sensitive to changes in cow health and comfort, and good rumination suggests a good cow management in addition to the nutrition factors. And rumen pH is highly sensitive to your feeding management, okay? How do you deliver the feed? How many times the cow eat? In addition to the dietary ingredient themselves, and individual cow rumen, uh, rumen pH can vary greatly even if they're eating the same TMR. And feeding sugar and reducing the starch can increase rumen pH. And rumination and rumination time, a pH, they're not always have a positive correlation. So the cows have the same rumination time doesn't mean they have the same amount of saliva production. And when they, when the, when they produce the saliva, when the cows are laying down is very important. So overstocking, increasing the risk of a ruminal acidosis, even without short-term milk production job. On that study, they show no difference in the milk yield. Actually, even the overstocked cows, they maintain the same milk yield. But again, there's a short-term study uh, but if they be able to check the rumen pH, you already see the harmful effects on the cow, but in the long term, you're definitely gonna see a difference. In the milk components, you would expect the milk fat will drop, but in the short term, you know, it's probably okay. So a lot of times, add, people using liquid feed or using a additive, they only look at, oh, nothing changed today. You know, I've been feeding for a week, nothing changed. But you know, the cows are changing every day. They're not going to show, not everything will be shown as a milk yield, milk production, but you are changing the fundamentals of the cow health, and all those will show up one day when suddenly something goes wrong or something, um, the cow's facing a challenge or weather change, the cows have better health, better foundation, they be able to handle that better, even if the short term comparison, their milk yield is the same. Um, so back to our trials showing the QOF, liquid supplements, increase the rumination by 20 to 30 minutes, indicating those cows had a better cow comfort and health status. And this is a consistent from the trial that the cows had a dramatic decreased metabolic diseases and higher milk yield, okay? So it's probably also likely cows received the liquid feed as a better dry matter intake and less sorting, and all those will help your um, dairy profitability. So overall, feeding the liquid feed is an effective strategy to increase the rumination time. And by replacing the starch, we know it will help increase your rumen pH as well. So um, overall, we hope um, that study shows you the importance of maintaining a higher rumen pH and rumination to your cow health and performance. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, what is the difference between a molasses-based sugar and a dry granular sugar out of a bag? Well, 
there's uh, many different differences, okay? The many feed child, our experience, you're feeding the, the dried sugar in there, you actually promote the cows to sort the diet, just like the corn grain, they taste good, and they're actually looking for that. So the molasses of sugar, even you provide exactly the same amount of sugar base to the cattle, just because the physical conditioning of the TMR is huge. I think that's not only due to the sugar effect itself, it really stick again the sorting, um, help digest the fiber better. So it's a total package, allow the cows to handle and eat and digest the total TMR better than the individual ingredient itself. That's a good point, but does the buck, room and bugs use those two sugars any differently? I think if, the, if you be able to sugar go to the rumen, they probably, um, you know, they will see them as a similar. But again, the dry sugar, there are some dry molasses for sale as well. But you got to know the dry molasses, they dry that with wheat middlings and some um, little uh, fiber um, stuff in there. So they're not totally digestible because when you're drying the dry molasses, you usually go through the higher temperature, okay? And the higher temperature, they won't tell you when you, when you cook on your kitchen, put a sugar there, we call it caramel, uh, caramelization. So you go through that process, kind of browning that sugar. So that sugar become less available for the animals. So, you know, so the, the, the dry sugar goes through a higher temperature would reduce the bioavailability for the animals to absorb that. So that's also a difference in there. So you're saying, what if you add water to the granulated sugar? Uh, what if you add a water to the, the to the grain? Stephen, you have the experience with that? The question is, what if you add a water to the dry sugar? And you want to improve rumination? Uh, compared to the molasses based liquid feed. If you put a water. We showed that slide earlier that when you added water, you reduced sorting in half, but you didn't stop it. You're, you're, that's not the question. The question is taking like granulated sugar, making a slurry with water, and feeding it. Rehydrating it. Rehydrating is that, is that sugar is as good as molasses. And I've got my opinion, but I want to hear yours. <laughs> I have mine too. <laughs> I, I would say no, and I'll tell you why, because there's uh, a couple of things in molasses that also stimulate the growth of the rumen bugs besides sugar. Molasses contains malic acid, and malic acid has been shown to stimulate the growth of rumen bugs. Molasses also contains B vitamins and that's been shown to stimulate the growth of rumen bugs. And, and then finally, molasses gives you a mixture of sugars, sucrose, glucose, and fructose, versus uh, making a slurry with just sucrose. But I was just asking about the sorting issue, not the other benefits of molasses, just the sorting, because it would be wet and you, sticky. You, I don't think you're gonna have the same stick factor. Oh, you don't, okay. you don't, you're not a right. sicky. I think it'd be better than you feeding the Just dry water. itself. But the molasses will definitely kind of stick, stick the short particles, long particles. Okay. But you, and the answer for that is there's natural gums in molasses, which you wouldn't be getting in that solution. Right. That, trying to give it that tackiness feel. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you've seen calf feeds or horse feeds that have, you know, 7 to 10% molasses. It, it almost crawls. That's some of the gums, you know, on the molasses. Plus, on the sugar basis, I think molasses is actually cheaper than the dry, right? Yeah, just from the cost standpoint, I think there's a benefit. Cost per pound of sugar. Yeah. yeah. Any more questions? I, I'm going to leave a couple tech sheets that summarize those two trials that we did in Michigan out here by the water bottle, so if you don't remember everything that Kai and Stephen went through, you can kind of take them home and read them at your convenience. Just a formal presentation, if somebody wants what you presented today, we can get that. Yeah, we can send that.